and uh, I'd be in my home place, totally. But this place feels a lot like home. Like Randy said, uh, Susie and I have been involved with Heartland since its, its inception. Uh, Brian and I were ordained on the same night together, and he and I have been friends since the mid-90s, as with uh, Randy. And back in the day, Brian was very involved in the, the uh, City Union Mission in downtown Kansas City, and I was the chaplain over the municipal jail in Kansas City. So we kept up with, hey, have you seen so-and-so? He's not here. Is he in jail? And back and forth. We kept up with the guys we were concerned about and stayed in touch with each other in that way. But uh, as we start this morning, if it's okay, I'd like to take a few minutes and talk about the ministry because I see an awful lot of new faces. I see some people I've known a long time, and I see some people I need to meet. And don't let me forget to introduce my wife. This is Susie sitting over here. Uh, if you haven't said hello to her, please do that before the day is over. Uh, she's pretty cool. <laughs> I kind of like her. So, uh, But uh, I, I want to say first, I need to apologize, I guess, first. Hanging out in jails and prisons, we can't use PowerPoint. We can't take pictures. So I don't have any of that stuff for you. But uh, I started going to a jail in, uh, in Kansas City, the municipal jail, in uh, 93 or 4. I'm not sure. 1993 or 4. I was not that much removed from the lifestyle that could have uh, gotten me there. Two or three years I'd been serving the Lord at that time. And I started going in with a group of guys and doing a little Bible study. And uh, I fit. It uh, was something that I was very comfortable in. I was, I was doing a lot of things. I was out of the church, Kansas City Baptist Temple, as it was called at that time. And the Lord got a hold of me uh, in late 1990, and, and I was all laid up, and I was doing everything I could and uh, getting involved in everything good. Too much for my wife's liking. She kept telling me to slow down. But when I went to this jail, um, as I said, I fit. I related. Um, there was something, something about that ministry and working with the men and women in that jail that uh, was very comfortable to me. And we had a lot of success. It became front and center. In 1996, me and a couple of other guys together were asked to be the chaplains, which gave us more access into the jail than just coming in and doing a Bible study. We could go around uh, in, wherever we wanted in the jail. We had uh, some limited keys. Um, we had the opportunity to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one in their living areas. And uh, that, just, that just moved things along faster. The ministry grew through the 90s. In the latter half of the 90s, I was going through what was called back then Shepherd School of Ministry at Kansas City Baptist Temple. Randy was in that a year or so ahead of me, I believe. And uh, the ministry began to grow. And I knew, and my wife and I, by 1999, that God was doing something here and that I needed to be doing this more full time. So I began to speak to our pastors about it. And uh, at the end of 2001, I began leaving my job. And in 2002, uh, we started a nonprofit ministry called the Keys Are at the Cross Prison Ministries. And that's been my full-time gig for the last uh, 16 years. It's been a blessing. How many of you here know somebody that is incarcerated at this moment, someone that's close to you or fairly close to you, that's incarcerated, incarcerated right now or has recently been incarcerated? Would you raise your hand? Raise them up high. Look around, church. This is our problem. This is our problem, and we do too little, actually, to uh, inflect or somehow impact that population. We, we tend to want to leave that to somebody else. It, it can be scary. It can be something we, we think we don't want to be in. If you go into a prison with me, the first time you get into a, a, a real prison and they slam the big steel door shut, that's a scary sound. If you walk through the yard and you see all these guys out there and you're walking very close to them and they're lifting weights and playing basketball and playing handball and they're tough looking guys, it's a scary thing. But when you sit down in a chapel with a group of inmates and begin to share Christ, you'll find out they're people just like you and they have a desire, many, many of them, greater than you can imagine to understand 
the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's been a great thing for us. It's, uh, like I said, since 2002, we've been involved in many things. Over the long term, most, uh, most of the things we've done have been chapel services in several different prisons. At one time, uh, 10 years or so ago, we were doing 40 different services in five or six different facilities. We're not doing that much right now. I've got about 18 folks with me, and we're doing things in five facilities. In fact, I have some guys in the prison in St. Joe right now in the diagnostic center going around. Uh, well, I guess they've left, but just left going around to the living areas and sitting down around tables with small groups of guys sharing the gospel, hearing, hearing what they had to say, listening to them while there's guys all around them doing push-ups, watching Jerry Springer on the TV and making all kinds of racket. But when you sit in a room like that and you talk to one or two or three guys and all of a sudden you see some tough guy get a tear in his eye, you know God's doing something there. And, and that's awesome stuff. And it's good to be involved in some of us do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. Years back, I used to do a lot of, uh, I'd organize and bring Christian rock groups into prisons, and we'd do big shows, and, and that was always fun. A lot of more people would come to a, to a band than come to chapel, uh, if you have a big event like that. Uh, we used to be, I used to participate in, not, not uh, oversee, but participate in motorcycle shows where a bunch of us would ride our motorcycles in. Once again, the inmates will come out. They want to look at the bikes, and we have opportunity to talk to them about Christ. And we used to hold a lot of uh, discipleship seminars. Right now, as I think I said a while ago, we have uh, about 18 people doing services in uh, five prisons in northwest Missouri. Uh, I was in St. Joe Thursday night. As I mentioned, some of the guys were in St. Joe again this morning. We had ladies last night in Chillicothe in the women's prison, and they had 37 women attend. We baptized a guy last Thursday night. So there's a lot of things like that going on. Through the years, we've done a lot of outreach to families, primarily through Angel Tree, if you've heard about that, uh, and been able to work with other churches to get involved in that as well. So hundreds of kids have received Christmas gifts from mom or dad who are incarcerated uh, at Christmas time. We ran a reentry office for seven years in the Kansas City area where we worked with inmates coming out. Um, uh, and trying to get reestablished in the community. As, as Randy mentioned, uh, we've done a lot of this uh, all across the city, helping other churches kick off ministries in different jails and prisons. Uh, I wouldn't say we really did that here. Steve used to come and hang out with us for a while before he helped kick off that thing here, Steve and his son, for a while at a, at a jail out here in Centerview. Uh, but we're still happy that we got to be kind of part of that. And I was continuing to talk to some of the guys uh, this morning about that. To wind this down before you get bored, for the last five years, I've been the facility chaplain at the Jackson County Detention Center in Kansas City. They house a thousand men and women in that eight-story building and five-story building uh, down at 13th and Cherry. And I had about uh, 100 religious volunteers from all over the city, different churches, different denominations, I had to work with uh, other groups as well um, to help facilitate the religious needs of all the inmates. And I did that, like I said, for five years. A couple of months ago, I left down there. I wasn't paid. We did that as part of our, our ministry. But I worked down there sort of kind of full time. And uh, I was there five days a week. Uh, but things got really bad. They started shutting down all the programming because of staffing issues. Uh, everything I started was... Uh, said it was being suspended, but it, it never came back. So eventually I decided the Lord was leading me to move on, and I'm spending more time back in the prisons. As I said, we run a 501c3, so we're completely supported by giving to our ministry. Um, this church supports us. People in this church support us, as other churches and people in their churches support us as well. So if... Uh, you feel like you are not a person that would like to go into a jail or a prison? If you are, talk to me about that. But if you feel like that's not you, but you're interested in our ministry and would like to support us, we'd love that. Uh, you can send directly to us or you can give it on your giving through Heartland Baptist Fellowship. Our mission statement is to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ to those under the supervision of the prison systems. We'll present them with biblical tools by which they might grow in Christ and begin to reach their community for him. 
We want inmates not just to get saved. We want inmates to learn what their responsibility as men and women of God is in the mission. See, my goal is not to just go into prisons and do what I call hug-a-thug. We don't want to give them give him cookies and milk and say, Jesus loves you. We want, to, we want to proclaim the gospel, and then to those that receive it, the responsibility they have to be part of the mission, as I said. We want them to truly begin to learn, love, and live the word of God. See, when God got a hold of me back in 1990, I truly bought in. I had, you know, I was in my early 30s. I had done like a lot of us had done. I went back and forth praying a prayer when I was in trouble and needed out of it. Uh, There was a short time in our very early 20s that my wife and I attended a church, um, but it wasn't a good church. And there was, well, there was just issues that I saw as a young man. And then one that finally came up just turned me away. And I walked away from church again at about 23 or 24 years old. And you know, the sin that I had lived in all my life, because I wasn't a, a choir boy, increased after that. Uh, I went into deeper depths through my late 20s and early 30s than, than I could ever have imagined. And I don't want to give you my testimony. I didn't even mean to say that. But, but when God got a hold of me, he got a hold of me good. When I realized who he was and who I was in him and what he had done for me, I was all laid up, y'all. I just, I was doing everything. So, it, it just, I used to say, I used to say I felt like I was John Wayne. I wanted to kick all the doors down and save everybody for Jesus. My wife, luckily, was there to say, let's ring the doorbell first, slow down. <laughs> I truly believed in what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't say some of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. I believe each of us has been called into ministry. That that takes many different forms, but includes the person raised in church who never really did anything too bad, to the lifer up at Crossroads Correctional Center who's done heinous things, but since that time met Jesus Christ. That's the preacher in the pulpit and the shy waitress. We all have a part, each and every one of us, but we need to step into that. However, Satan doesn't want you and I plugged in and active in the mission. He doesn't want us being involved in God's work, and he'll help us. Believe me, he'll help us to find lots of reasons not to be. How many of you like to camp? A few? How many have bonfires, maybe? Some of you guys live on on acreage. That's fun. Sit around the night and have a big fire. You know how the next morning when you get up and you walk out there, it's just a bunch of ashes. It looks dead. But if you get a stick and put it in there and stir that up, it gets hot again, doesn't it? Most of the time, if you had a good fire the night before, the fire's still there, it's just tamped down. Here in 2 Timothy, which is the text I'd like you to turn to, 2 Timothy chapter 1, in the uh, Bibles that are available there in your pews, I believe it's on page 918. In prison, we say, when you get it, say amen. If you're still looking, say, hold up. Some of you aren't being truthful. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 1 is where I want to go. And here in 2 Timothy 1, Paul tells Timothy in this letter to him to stoke up that fire in his spiritual life. And he's telling that to us through the scriptures. We've got to stir up that fire that's placed inside of us by the Holy Spirit of God. If you want to endure in your walk with Christ, pay attention to what Paul tells this young preacher. He gives us three things that I want to pull out of this this morning that will help every believer who wants God uh, to, to use him. Every believer who wants to serve God needs to remember these three things. Let me read the text first. I want to begin in verse 6 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Would you pray with me real quick? Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, still my thoughts and, and my speech, help me to articulate well the things that you want me to say, uh, help me to communicate uh, to the best of this week's servant's ability. As was already stated here once today, Lord, I pray even more that each and every person in this room who listens to what we say, in spite of me, hears what you need them to hear, that their hearts are touched and whatever the need may be and uh, whatever way they need to uh, draw near to you or whatever the case may be. Most importantly of all, Lord, if there are people here who don't know you as their Savior, there are people here who, who have an interest, who know they need to draw near to you maybe, but really don't know what it means to be a child of the King, to be born again, I pray today that uh, that opportunity would occur and that they would uh, respond to that. We love you, Lord. I thank you for this church and my friendship with them, and I uh, pray you'd be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys used to have a clock up there that I could see. How much, when's my time up? One o'clock? Okay. Here in this book, we have a picture of Paul as an older man preparing to die. Or that's not the picture of the book, but that's the picture of the author writing this letter. He was in prison in Rome somewhere in his early 60s, we believe, and I think probably a little worse for the wear. He was about my age or a little bit older, but his life had been far rougher in the last 30 years. Think back on the physical abuse, abuse he had taken. Let me just read you something here from 2 Corinthians 11. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Now he goes on, but do you ever just stop and think about that? Five times... He had suffered 40 lashes save one. He'd been whipped terribly five times in his life. Thrice he was beaten with rods. Now this ain't the switch grandma used to grab. I think back every time I read this to the, the guy in uh, Thailand, the American in Thailand years back, 15, 10, 15 years ago, I don't know how long it's been, but he was caught breaking the law, I think it was a drug offense, and he was going to be, they called it caned, caning. Man, the world went in uproar to make sure that didn't happen. Something very similar happened to Paul three different times. Once I was stoned, you remember this in Lystra, to the point of thought dead, if not being dead. These guys didn't throw rocks like we used to throw at the bus stop. These were big old stones. They threw, meaning to, meaning to crush bones, meaning to kill. Thrice I, I, I suffered, sorry, that's hard to spit out, shipwreck. Three times he had been sunken or wrecked on a boat in the sea, and there weren't no Coast Guard back then. A night and a day I spent in the deep. These were terrible trials this fellow had been through. And like I said, he goes on in that passage in 2 Corinthians to, to, to talk about further ones, but he wasn't complaining. The emphasis of this letter in 2 Timothy, which is going to be our text, I'll keep coming back to it, even though I'll go back and forth to other places. So if, if, rather than not keeping up, just listen and I'll read it to you. But the emphasis here to Timothy is his need to endure. Hang in there, Tim. That's what he's writing to him about. About He's going to die in Rome. He's aware of that evidently, or fairly sure of that. He wants to encourage this young friend of his. And here, as I said, he is writing his last letter to his closest disciple before he's put to death what's on his mind. 
Stir up the gift of God, as it says there in chapter 6. Stir up the gift of God. He's still thinking about the ministry, the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ that was given to him some 30 years earlier, even in this position he's in, even though he's there about to be put to death. You know what I'd be doing? I'd be writing you guys. Hey, come get me out of here. Hey, they're going to put me to death and I haven't done nothing. Probably. But Paul was focused on challenging this young man to keep up with the ministry. He was about to lose his head. Literally. And what a horrible death that must have been. And his thoughts are on Jesus and those people that need him. So before he leaves this world, he writes this letter to Tim. Let me pull out three little things out of uh, this passage that I read to you a moment ago. It says in verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Do you ever have fear sharing your faith? The Greek word that's translated fear here in verse 7 really has to do with being timid. It's the only time that Greek word is used in the, uh, in the New Testament. Are you ever timid? Are you ever shy to speak the truth? Does someone maybe with uh, more worldly prominence, whatever the case may be, do, do they intimidate you? Maybe they have a position of authority over you. Maybe they have a higher education or a greater education or perceived intelligence. Maybe they're a person of means, someone of wealth, someone that you feel you're not necessarily comfortable to be with. You think he won't listen to me and he'll think I'm beneath him. We may not admit that, but we think that sometimes, don't we? Paul says, don't be afraid. <clears throat> Stir up the gift of God, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Don't be afraid. Do you let your perceived shortcomings keep you quiet? Maybe it's you worrying about your ability. Maybe I don't know the Bible well enough, or maybe I don't have, have good recall, or I just don't have confidence speaking to people. Do you ever let that hold you back? I think this is common among many of us. Honestly, I'm not the preacher of the caliber of many friends I know. I know some guys that are some amazing preachers. I can't communicate like some of them. But I'm not insecure enough to pass on opportunities to share the gospel and the good news about my king. And as also was mentioned earlier, we need to all be that way. Maybe especially sitting in a duck boat before you get out on the water. If you would... Like I said, keep your finger or bookmark here, but if you would, turn back to Exodus chapter 3 with me. Some of you all know where I'm going. Now here we have the record of Noah, Moses, coming upon the burning bush and God speaking to him from that bush. You remember Moses had been raised in Pharaoh's house. He had been a man of privilege, but he evidently knew his ethnicity, his legacy, his people, and he took it upon himself to kill an Egyptian, and therefore he ran away. It was many, many years away in the wilderness. Now I hear God speaking to him. And God tells him to go back to Egypt. And here in verse 11 is Moses' first response. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel? I'm nobody to stand before Pharaoh. Don't you know my history back there, Lord? And I'm just not that type of guy. But then God shut that down. So next in verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of her fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What's his name? What, what am I going to say? 
Moses is like, what do you think they're going to say to me when I say God sent me to talk to you and tell you this? Oh, yeah, right? What's his name? Who is he really? But God answers that very clearly. I am that I am. I'm the always is. That's an amazing answer. Study that out sometime on who our God said he was to Moses. But Moses still had fear. In chapter 4, verse 1, he said, they won't believe me. They're not going to listen to me. Why would they believe me? I ran away from them and left them all there in captivity years ago. God still shut him down. In verse 10 of chapter 4, he says, I, I, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not the guy. God shut him down again. God just said, I just want you to be faithful to go. I'm going to take care of the rest. Moses finally begged in, in uh, verse 13, please just send anybody else. But God used this man to go stand before Pharaoh, probably the greatest man in the world at his time, and proclaim what God said and lead the Israelites out of captivity and literally have a major impact and change on the world, both physically and spiritually. He can do amazing things through you as well, ladies and gentlemen, young people, if you're just willing to not argue and be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do you believe the word? Verse 7 said, and we read it, <laughs> that feeling, that fear feeling is not from God. God hath not given. Turn back to, I'm sorry, I hadn't done that, but turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So what does it say he has given us in the rest of that verse? Power, love, and a sound mind. Power. God hath not given us fear. That doesn't come from him, but power. What's power? It's, it's authority. It's strength. Possibly miracles in the case of Moses. Mighty deeds. Ephesians chapter 3, 7, you don't have to turn there, but it talks about his power. Paul writes, wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Paul says, I'm a ministry by the power of God. Or I'm a minister by the power of God. Unto me, he says, who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He was amazed at what God was doing through him. Let me tell you, I'm amazed, ladies and gentlemen, and this wasn't my plan to say either, but in the 24 years that I've been doing this jail and prison ministry, 16 years I've been doing it as my full-time job, we have seen literally hundreds of people come alongside of us, as Randy was mentioning, or uh, ask me to come and speak to them so they could start their own group in some jail or prison somewhere. Hundreds. Through just our people who have been, I don't know, dozens and dozens who have worked with me through the years, we have seen hundreds of men and women come to know Jesus Christ. We've baptized dozens of people. Men, I guess I haven't baptized any women, but men in prisons, several different prisons. I, I, I got to travel to a prison in Parchman, Mississippi years ago, and I spent a day. This, this prison has uh, like 5,000 acres. It's, it's amazing. I, I don't remember the exact number. But they've got housing units every half mile or so, and 50 to 100 men in each of those housing units, and they work this huge farm. It used to be like a major labor camp. There's still a whipping post out by the front entrance that they used to use back in the day. But I got to spend the day in the HIV AIDS house telling men who were either HIV positive or had full-blown AIDS about Jesus Christ. It was an amazing day. Some of the people with me didn't want to go in. You know, I figure if God leads you somewhere, he's going to protect you. Another time, well, actually several times, Ron Green and I and some of the other parts of the team once traveled to several different prisons in Texas and did marriage seminars where they brought the wives of the men into the prison for a weekend deal. I mean, they had to go out at night and back in. 
but we spent Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in small groups with marriage, marriage enrichment materials. It's been amazing. I never could have thought, I never could have thought that God would allow me to do all these different things. But he does if you fall in love with him and let him take you down his path. Just get excited about who he is and what he's done. Don't be afraid. Let me read a couple other verses to back up my comment about power. <clears throat> Ephesians 3.20 says, talking about the power that worketh in us, now unto him, this goes to what I just said, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He can do exceedingly above all that you could ask or think. I've actually got to go all over the world since the early 90s when God got a hold of me. Before that, I'd never been anywhere but in trouble. I swear. <laughs> you know, or maybe down to uh, the, the lake or the, or the, the river to, to canoe. God will do things in your life if you allow him to take you. 2 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5 says, And my speech, once again, this is Paul talking. I'm sorry, this is 1 Corinthians 2. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There's a lot of smart people out there that can spew a lot of stuff at you. But don't be impressed by man's wisdom if it doesn't feel like the power of God. So he gives us power. He gives you power. Do you understand that if you know Jesus Christ, you already have that power? It's not something you have to attain by how much you grow. It is something you have to be, learn how to utilize by how much you grow, but you already have it. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Ephesians 1.3, Paul says that God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, past tense. And he repeats similar comments like that in the next several verses. In uh, 2 Peter 2, I'm sorry, 1, verse 3, Pete says, God hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Hath. If the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you, you have no reason to fear because you have the power of God inside of you to do whatever it is he might direct you to do. Now, don't do like I had a couple of inmates four or five years ago decided God had told them that they could leave the maximum security prison in Cameron, just walk up to the gate and declare it to open. <laughs> Fools did it. And it did not go like they planned, I promise you. <clears throat> it, was a, it was a disaster. Don't, don't, don't get mixed up. Don't get ahead of God. Don't put your desires on what God desires for you. Just get close and let him show you his power. The next thing in verse 7, we, or we read that God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. The next one is love. Agape. Unselfish love. Just loving somebody. Charity. Giving without expecting anything in return. You know, we don't do that nowadays, even in our marriages. Our homes don't last today because one or the other says, you're not meeting my needs, you're not doing what I want, so I don't love you anymore. Man, thank the Lord Jesus doesn't say that to me. Thank the Lord he loves me in spite of me and continues. And I'm talking through my Christian years, right? Not even counting what was before that. Love. We need to keep meditating and exercising that gift no matter what we get in return. And then finally in verse 7 he says a sound mind. Self-control. Moderation. Sober. I'm not talking about being sober from alcohol or drugs necessarily. But a sober mind. Having control of, of your thoughts and your demeanor. Keep your head on straight. Be wise. The power to live that way resides in you. These are God-given gifts that you can exercise as believers. As it is implied, he didn't give us fear, but they're God-given. These others are God-given. Power, love, and a sound mind. So have no fear. 
1 Corinthians 2.12 says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Don't be afraid. Don't let Satan plant false fear, or as this particular word really says, uh, timidity or shyness in you. Know that you've got, fa- that you've got power. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Hmm. Don't be ashamed. This is familiar, or similar, I should say, to, 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 to don't be afraid, don't be ashamed, but it's, it's not the same. Sometimes we allow false fear to bring us disgrace. Do you allow intimidation of the world to make you feel inferior sometimes? Can somebody uh, uh, not feel like they have necessarily just too high of an authority for you to deal with, but somebody that treats you in a way, or you feel like it's going to treat you in a way that, that, that uh, is shameful for you? Do you think it's uncool, especially younger people? Or if you're in college or school or, or on the workplace, do you think it's uncool to speak out about Jesus? Do you want to fit in with some group so you, you keep your faith on the down low so everybody likes you? You sit and listen to things being said that you might normally not want to hear? I see that on prison yards all the time, especially maximum security prisons. A lot of times there's some young Christians or uh, uh, immature Christians who they'll sneak into the chapel sometimes, but they ain't out there on the yard talking about Jesus because they'd be ridiculed or maybe worse. Don't be ashamed. Paul said in Romans 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because, this is important, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Don't, Don't be ashamed of the gospel. That's what changes lives. And maybe you will be the only person that has a real opportunity to share that in the right way at the right time with somebody. Paul says, never be ashamed because of, notice he said there in verse 8, be not thou therefore ashamed. Now I used to hear this all the time, the church I came out of, I don't know if you've heard it here or not, but when you see be not thou therefore, you got to think about what it's there for. It's therefore because of what he just said. Because you have power and love and a sound mind, don't be ashamed. Remember what's inside of you. Be a partaker of Christ's afflictions, it says. That's that's easy to preach. It's easy to say. Smile in the face of of adversity. Not so so easy in the day-to-day life. Paul tells us in Romans 5 that if we're justified by faith in Christ, we should rejoice in the hope of glory. If we have that hope of glory to come, then we won't be ashamed. But you know, we've got to keep that at the forefront of our heart and our mind so we're prepared when that adversity comes along. Look over there at Romans 5 with me. Therefore, remember that, go back and look at verse 4. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm in verse 2 now. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope, and that hope maketh not ashamed. Kind of ties in real well to what we were reading, doesn't it? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, 
which is given unto us. Don't be ashamed. You know, sometimes, I don't think a lot of us do this enough. Maybe I'm wrong. But sometimes I just sit and meditate in my prayer time on the sufferings of Christ on the cross and prior to that, that day. How much disgrace did the Son of God endure for us? And not only that day, 30 plus years before that, the Son of God, I like to say, allowed himself to be incarcerated in the womb of a woman, go through the pains of birth to live as a basic nobody in the world's view for 30 plus years, surrounded by sin. You know, a lot of times sin disgusts me. How do you think Jesus felt walking around, seeing it and hearing it all the time? But he did all that and then allowed himself to be truly incarcerated and taken to the cross. Before they did that, they spit in his face. Ever had anybody spit in your face? I'll be honest, I love Jesus, but I might knock him into next week. I don't know. They beat him in his face. They whipped him. They stripped him naked. They made fun of him with the crown of thorns and the reed. Oh, you're the king. And they took that reed and pounded that thing so that it punctured his skin on his head. They pretended to bow. Then they hung his severely torn body on a cross and lifted him up before his mother and his friends and the entire community. They mocked him, dared him to prove who he was, and then they killed him in a horrific, horrific way. I want to be careful what I say, youngsters in the room and all that. But you don't die on the cross because of a few nail holes. There comes a time when you can't hold yourself up on your legs anymore. And your organs begin to collapse on your lungs. And you try to push yourself up and get a breath every once in a while. And then they come by and break your legs so you can't push yourself up. And you're asphyxiated. That's the horror of the cross. Now God took his son before they broke his legs, but he still suffered that. And not for a crime, not for anything he'd done, but because me and you needed him to. How shameful. Maybe he didn't even feel that that day as he hung there, but how shameful it must have seemed to those looking on, him hanging on that cross, so destroyed. You know that so many who never believed his teaching anyway stood in the crowd and mocked him as well and laughed as they went back home that day. He did that for you and I. How does that compare to any way anybody that we might share the gospel with could make us feel ashamed? It doesn't compare. What are they going to do? Say unkind words to us? Let me ask you to turn to Mark 8. In beginning in verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whatsoever, I'm sorry, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall, it, uh, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. 
Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. He talks about us laying down our life. It doesn't mean the same. It could mean, it has meant for millions through the centuries, but unlikely for you and I. He's asking us to lay down the desires of this world, the things that seem uh, what we want, what we'd like to have, what we might think we deserve to have in the eyes of the society we live in. He's asking you to minimize those and I to minimize those and give up whatever he requires to serve him. I don't think that's too much to ask. So we can't be afraid and we can't be ashamed. Lastly, verse 9, back in our text in 2 Timothy. Y'all had your fingers there. That was one quick turn. I like that. He says, be not thou, I'm sorry, verse 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Not according to our works. Don't be arrogant. This is kind of the other side of what I've been talking about this morning. Maybe we're not timid. Maybe we're not ashamed. Maybe some of us are up in everybody's face letting them know everything we know about the Bible all the time. That happens sometimes. I see it in prison quite a bit. A guy designates himself Bishop of B-Pod, you know, and expects everybody to pay attention and listen to him and, and in that way honor him and give him self-strength and power in that prison. Some of us use our knowledge of the Word of God to puff ourselves up and be, begin to think we're all that in a bag of chips. That can happen in good churches, like this church. You get great teaching, get given great opportunities to learn how to study and grow in the Bible your own selves. You get many opportunities to be involved in missions and, or ministries locally here and, and work alongside other peoples in your church. You get opportunities to be involved in missions. Some people get puffed up. We need to remember God didn't save you or I <clears throat> because he knew what a great testimony we would have that we could get up and share with everybody. I tell every inmate when he's getting out of prison to go plug into the closest good church to where he's going to be, and I give him some direction on that, and if I know where he's going, I might even direct him to a church. But then I tell him, just sit in the back for a year. Come on Saturdays when they need somebody to cut the grass. Get involved in a small group if they have that and listen. But don't be up front and offering to give your testimony of what a bad boy you've always been and how your prison life was. That's, that's, that's not growing in Christ. That's once again magnifying self. You know, I personally have some unbelievable stories. As I said earlier, God didn't get a hold of me until my early 30s. And I lived on the other side of the cross just about as powerfully as I do for him on this side. But my sin shouldn't impress you. And it shouldn't be something I want to brag about. I want to brag about what Jesus has done. So don't be arrogant. He didn't save you because he knew you'd be a great preacher. <clears throat> I think we're much more likely than Tim to have these problems in the society we live in today. Susie and I used to talk all the time, especially at the beginning of this ministry. I don't want to get the look at me's, you know. And, and, and it's hard when you're trying to raise support, or at least it was for me. I was never good at that. Luckily, God's blessed me. I don't want to go out and tell everybody how great what we were doing was. I, I don't know. It just seemed weird to me. Uh, and I did, a lot, I did a lot of it the first year or two. Uh, but then I said, Lord, I'm not good at this. And, and I feel like I'm, I'm like showing off sometimes or, or they're asking me to show off. And 
I said, if you want me to do this, you, need to, you just need to help me. Help me get through, support me. And he's done that. He's done that. Now I like to come hang out with churches like this that I know. But I don't get out on the road. I don't spend several months a year. And, and, and some people have to. I'm, 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 I'm a very odd kind of missionary. I stayed at home. You know, I spend my days in prisons and I come back to my own house. I didn't leave the country. So it's different for me. He didn't need us to accomplish his mission. And I tell groups of inmates that all the time. I tell them, look around. And we can do that here, look around. Why did God want us to be what he used to save this sinful world? Kind of hard to imagine if you think about it. But he did. He saved us because he loved us. You, don't know, you and I don't have any understanding of spiritual things that God didn't teach us either through his Holy Spirit in our time in the Word or through other good men that stand before you. So we need to be humble and share what he's taught us in humility. You have a holy calling. 1 Corinthians 1, 25 speaks of, and, and beyond speaks of God using the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world, the weak things to confound the mighty. Don't get all caught up in yourself. Just be excited about Jesus. In Christ, it is Christ in us. Our flesh can't glory. It's all for his purpose. You and I are not the issue. I have some favorite verses. Ephesians 1 says we are predestinated according to the purpose of him. That's obvious. 2.10 says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Before that, he tells us we didn't do anything to save ourselves. But now that you're saved, I got things for you to do, y'all. Colossians 1.16 is one of my favorites. The last phrase of that, that verse says we were made by him and for him. That verse changed my life back in the early 90s. I was already serving him. But when I got my head around, the only reason I am sucking in air is to serve him. Everything else is peripheral. It changed my life. He's a mighty God. Romans 11 speaks of him and all things are through him and to him. He's everything and we need to remember where we came from. With all we can learn, with all the things I try to go in and share with the guys in the different prisons we go to, I'm just as big a sinner as each and every one of them. Might not have committed the same sins, but I was just as lost. Don't be afraid, don't be ashamed, and don't be arrogant. We've got to understand the power we need to stoke up that fire that we talked about in the beginning. Our strength comes from Him, our worth comes from Him, our purpose comes from Him, what we are here for. So remember those three things, if you would. Don't be afraid, don't be ashamed, don't be arrogant. Don't allow yourselves to get puffed up before man, nor to feel unable or unworthy to speak God's truth to whoever he puts you in front of. He fuels the fire. We just got to keep it stirred up and do it with humility. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I pray that